Turn to the person next to you and say, are you ready to build? You ready to build? How many of y'all just love building stuff? Where's like the builders at? Like, you may not be an actual construction person, but you just love to build stuff. Yes, I'm with you. Where's the people who just love tearing down stuff? Like, you just love breaking things. You're like, give me a sledgehammer. I want to bust through some walls and break some stuff. There's something just, ah, uh, just feels good. Feels good to have a hammer. In fact, I got, I got a tool belt with me this morning. I figured I would build some stuff with y'all today. If you guys are all right with that. You guys cool with that? You guys want to build some stuff today? <laughs> this is a heavy tool belt here. I'm trying to make sure I get it right. Don't look right now. Okay, here we go. All right, Psalm 127. Y'all ready there? This is what the psalmist said. He said, unless the Lord builds the house. Unless the Lord builds the house. I remember when I was um, getting ready to graduate from ORU my senior year. Come on, ORU. And I had this huge like vision and dream and I was gonna do all this stuff. And I had written down all these plans and like I had a blueprint, right, for, for my future. I had this, had this like plan of what I wanted to build and what I wanted to do and, and how it was all gonna happen. And I felt in my heart that I was supposed to go and see an old friend, a guy that I had grown up with. And so I drove 10 hours from Tulsa to Colorado Springs and um, went to go see my friend Daniel Grothy. And I was, I was staying at Daniel's house for like three or four nights. And he said, Paul, why are you here? I said, well, one, I just needed to get into the mountains, needed to see the mountains, wanted to see Pikes Peak, never been there, you know, in that area before. And I said, two, I just needed to be around someone that I had grown up with that would pray over my future and just, you know, give me some advice, some wisdom. And he took me to the scripture. He said, Paul, read Psalm 127, and I want you to tell me what you hear. So I went to it, I opened it up, and I said, unless the Lord builds the house. And he said, stop right there. He said, Paul, if God's not in it, then it's a waste of time. If God's not building your life, if he's not the architect, like if this is just Paul's plans, then, <laughs> then you're gonna be in trouble. But if these are God's plans, if this is God's dream, if this is his blueprint for your life, if the Lord builds the house, then the house will always stand. If the Lord is building the house, then the house will always have value and significance and it will always have meaning. Now hear what I'm saying. You can build a beautiful house, you can have a ton of money, you can drive the nicest cars, you can live in the most prosperous you know, neighborhood or zip code, but unless the Lord builds the house, he that labors, labors in vain. Unless God's in charge of the vision. And this is a series about vision. This is a series about faith. This is a series about your house, my house, this house. This is a series about your family. And I wanna encourage you, don't miss a week during this month. This is going to be one of the most important series we've ever done as a church. Because there's vision that I wanna share with you that's, that's a part of this house. But I also believe God has vision he wants to speak to you that's about your house. And so before we get into any more of this message, I wanna show you this video, and it's, it's a video our, our media team made, and it's about the power of a house. What is the meaning of a house? What does a house do in your life? What is your house all about? What is God's house all about? So check this out. A home begins as a blank canvas of walls, ceilings, and floors. Each room precisely measured, angles and archways, Plaster, brick, wood and glass. Beautifully rendered surfaces effortlessly hide the strength of the solid foundation within. And yet, a home is more than a design of rooms and things. Home becomes the unacknowledged witness to the ebbs and flows of our living, breathing humanity. These floors know the first tentative steps of infancy the stampede of youthful play, doors that observe goodnight kisses, that welcome and bid farewell to life's many seasons. Dark corners watch sorrowful tears and hear desperate prayers. A home experiences much as its inhabitants sculpt it with their living. As life's journey unravels, a home is shaped with human lives clutched close to heart. A home speaks. This home speaks of us, the house we are building together. Every day, each of us is building, 
Building memories, a life, a future. Building what your children will live in and what your grandchildren will remember. The question is not, can you build? But, what will you build? This is a house we have built together. This house has many rooms and every room has a purpose. The architect is calling us to expand this house. It's a time to build. It's a time to unite and see what this home can become. Who knows what is waiting? Who is waiting on the other side of what we can build together? We are called to build this house. All right, so say it with me. Build this house. We are called to build this house. When we get involved with building God's house, God gets involved with building our house. You know, when we commit to be a part of the house that God has placed us in, and when I look at this church, I see this, this place as a house. In fact, I think I'm gonna build a house on stage today, and I might need some help. Daniel, will you come up here? Tim, Drew, give these guys a big hand. They serve here on the staff, and I think we got some construction hats. Let's get these guys in some hard hats. Let's, let's build something today. Am I wearing it right? <laughs> there we go. Hey, I used to be, I used to be a part of building some stuff. I've, I've built some stuff before. I've, how many of y'all have ever built a house before? Or helped like construct or like been a part of construction? Anyone ever remodeled your house or hired someone to build a house? All right. Anyone related to anybody who's ever done anything that I'm mentioning? I'm gonna get all the hands to be raised today. <laughs> Looking for 100% participation. But there's, there's, there's something about just getting out there and building something, doing something, and, and, and the hammers and the nails, the sound of construction, right? The drill, you can hear it. And it feels awesome to see something go up. How many of y'all were here when this church was being built? When we were constructing, or when we were constructing the next generation building this last year when it was completed? There's something powerful about seeing all of this stuff come together, all the people working together to build something. And in the same way, God says, that's what I want my church to be like. I want everybody to be a part of building something with eternal value. I want to take you to Hebrews chapter three, verse one. This is the message version. Yeah, you can make noise. We love the word of God here. And the author of Hebrews, he says this, so my dear Christian friends, my companions in following this call to the heights, Take a good, hard look at Jesus. He is the centerpiece of everything we believe. Let me just say this. Jesus is the centerpiece of the house here at Victory. Without Jesus, we don't have a church. We are not a website. We are not a YouTube channel. We are not a building. We are not an organization. We are a family committed to our centerpiece, and he is Jesus. And when we gather, we lift up his name. And when we come together, we're not just here to hear motivational speeches, to sing some good songs, to, to, to build a community. No, we are here to worship Jesus. And I'm telling you, when you get Jesus at the center of your house, everything changes. I'm so thankful that we're not just a church just trying to look cool. No, we are a church that is all about Jesus and all about showing the world his love. This is what Hebrews says. He says, Jesus is the centerpiece of the house and he's faithful in everything that God gave him to do. Now, these people who were reading this book at this time, they had pledged their allegiance to Moses. They were Jews, and in the Old Testament, the Jewish people looked at Moses as he was like the leader. He gave the Ten Commandments. He helped get the Israelites out of Egypt. And so, you know, the author of Hebrews says, listen, Moses was good, but he was not the main piece. Moses was faithful to build the house, just like David, just like Solomon, just like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, just like you and I are called to build, but there is one builder who is over them all. And he says this, Jesus gets far more honor. A builder is more valuable than a building any day. When we look at this room and we see this beautiful sanctuary that we're sitting in, we understand that there was people who built this place. There were people who sacrificed their finances. They came and they helped build victory. In 1981, two young adults from ORU, Billy Joe and Sharon Darty, they came to this city from Arkansas and they had a vision in their heart to build a house of worship. And here we are 40 years later and the house still stands. And they built it 
on a relationship with Jesus. This is what Hebrews is saying is, listen, every house has a builder, but the builder behind them all is God. When you invite God to build your house, when you pull God into your plans and you say, Lord, I want you to build every room. I want you to be in charge of every part of my life. When you do that, God begins to bless your house. And then he says this, Moses did a good job in God's house, but it was all servant work, getting things ready for what was to come. Christ, as the son of God, is in charge of the house. And I'm gonna say it right here. Jesus is the head of this church right here. Jesus is the head of this house. And he says, if we keep a firm grip on this bold confidence, we are that house. So I want you to imagine yourself in, in, in kind of, in like just close your eyes for a second. Imagine that you're a house and that God is constructing you. And, and I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like I'm a fixer upper. I feel like I need Chip and Joanna Gaines to come and just like do a whole different revision on parts of my life. How many of y'all would say you're kind of a fixer upper type of a house? Like you, you got some things God's still working on, right? So during this series, what I believe God wants to speak to you and to me is, what places in our life does God need to come in and renovate and restore and redeem and renew because we are his house? But I think about how every house has a different look. Every house has a different shape. Like when you drive through Tulsa, not every house is the same. There's certain neighborhoods where you have like cookie cutter houses that all look similar, but there's a whole lot of different types of houses out there. This last week, I was looking at different houses online, and I was typing in like the weirdest looking houses, and I came across some interesting ones. I wanted to show them to you. Um, these are houses that people actually live in. Yeah, like that's, <laughs> that's kind of cool though. I like that. Some of y'all are like, I would never live in that type of a house. Um, this one's interesting. It's just, some of y'all feel like this. You're just upside down right now. Uh, yeah, that one, I mean, like let's go, let's fly every day. Let's, let's get in the plane. There's like kind of a Tetris one right there. But these are actual houses. That's, I feel like my kids would love that house right there. Just a doggy house, legit. Um, and then I came across castles. Like there's castles all over the world and every castle is different. Every castle has a different like look to it. I wanna, I wanna show you this one. This is a castle um, in England. And just keep going through it. This, or that's the one in England. That's Windsor Castle right there. That one's in Czech Republic. You could see the difference between each one. This was in Ireland, Kilkenny. There's, there's castles all over the world and each one has a different look, a different vibe. That one's in France, just an entire island castle right there. It's beautiful, right? And I, I got to thinking how God has called each church in this city to build a different expression of his house. When I look at Life Church and I see what God's doing through Craig Rochelle and I look at Mike Todd and Transformation Church, these are friends of mine. And I look at Church on the Move and, and I see all these great churches, Asbury United Methodist Church and, and, and South Tulsa Baptist Church. There's all these different houses and they're all unique. But then you come to victory and there's something different about this house. You're like, this house is a little different. Like, I don't know what it is, but there is something about this house that just feels different, right? And I love that when, when my mom and dad started dreaming, there's something about sitting down and, and dreaming, what do we wanna do with this room? If you've ever renovated your house or you've ever you know, decided to do a project where you decided to renovate a room or add an addition or change the kitchen, you sit down and you start dreaming a little bit and you figure out what's our budget, what, what can we do, all right, we've got this amount of money, all right, what kind of countertop do we want? What do we wanna paint this wall over here? And you start dreaming and in the same way, God's called us to dream of what he wants to do with this house. So pastors Billy Joe and Sharon, my parents, they started dreaming in the 80s and they said, let's, let's dream of what kind of house God wants to build here. And they started building this house to be a house where we, we would worship with a spirit-filled atmosphere where there would just be a, an expression of, of, of our beliefs in God and the power of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. And it's weird to some people, but it's our house. It's our house. And then they said, let's not just be a church that meets on Sundays. Let's build some rooms in this house. Let, let's, let's, let's build some rooms that are different than other churches. So I got some stuff here that I wanted to, to nail here. Um, one of the rooms that, that they decided to build <laughs> these, these papers are all together here. One of the rooms they decided to build in this 
house 20 years ago is a room called the Tulsa Dream Center. This room right here. Come on, how many of y'all have ever served at the Tulsa Dream Center? This room right here, every single day of the week, is changing North Tulsa. This room right here is impacting boys and girls on a daily basis, moms and dads, through our grocery outreaches, through our after-school care, through our athletic programs. What were they doing? They were, they were coming in the house and they said, let's dedicate a room just to, to, to North Tulsa. Now, there's a lot of churches that serve at the Dream Center, but this place right here exists because this house was built in 1981. This is a room in our house. We are one house with many rooms. Not only that, but we started to think about how can we reach our city? And so we got this, <laughs> it is hard to bend down with this tool belt right now. These tools are like poking me right in the belly button. Here we go. All right, Victory Reach. This room right here, every single day, we are sending teams of people out into our city, north, south, east, and west. Not only that, but they're going to places where there's been disaster, where there's been hurricanes, and there's been all kinds of pain where people are walking through, and we're sending teams. In fact, during the month of March, we're sending teams to five different locations to go on mission trips. Then we're going in the summer back to Brazil to do mission trips in other nations. This is happening locally and globally. This is a room in our house. Another room in our house is our campuses. Every single week, we have campuses, not just here, but we have campuses in North Tulsa, out in Manford. We have campuses right now that are meeting 40 miles from here, 20 miles from here, and there's people getting saved, healed, and set free in this house. I love that when we started dreaming about this house, we started thinking, what do we wanna do? What do we wanna build here? Not just a church, but we wanna build a place where people can learn the Bible, where we can raise up disciples, Victory College. Come on, any Victory College students or graduates in the house? And we started looking through the house. We said, let's get a room for every passion that we have out there. We have people in our church that do car repair every single week for single parents. Guys who say, you know what, I can't preach, I can't sing, but I can fix somebody's car. We have people in this, in this house who say, you know, I can't, I can't go on a missions trip, but I'll be your plumber. I'll come and take care of whatever leaks you got. I'm gonna take care of the widows in the church. We have plumbers, we have car repair guys. We had two guys transfer this year into our school, which by the way, Victor Christian School is one of the rooms in our house. But they came here because of our baseball program. One of the rooms in our house was baseball. I'm so thankful that our church dreams bigger than just Sunday morning services. We said, let's get a baseball field. Have you guys seen the Victory baseball field back there? It's, it's amazing. How many of you guys have seen our baseball field back there? Someone donated that. Someone said, I want to pay for Victory to have a, a world-class baseball stadium. And you say, well, what's the purpose of that? How does that help people? It's a doorway into the house. Some of you came here not because of preaching, not because of singing, not because of a great kids ministry, but because of a production. Because our church said, you know what? Let's incorporate the arts. How many of you guys enjoyed Pilgrim's Playlist the last, last month? How many of you guys have been to our Christmas plays, our Easter plays, all that stuff? That's a room in our house. Now, when I look at that room in our house, I start thinking about some of the pictures I just showed you of the weird houses out there. And people would look at Victor and they go, that's a weird house. And I'm okay with that. I want to be weird. Normal is boring. I don't want to be a cookie cutter church. I don't want to be a church that only meets on Sundays with just one sermon and worship. I want to be a church that does crazy stuff. I want to be a church that's reaching people in North Tulsa, South Tulsa, out in Manford, Oklahoma. I want to be a church that's doing productions that turn into movies and end up on Netflix and Amazon. I think about our worship team. Our, our worship team, is, it's an it's a entrance into this house. How many are thankful for the songs that are flowing out of Victory Worship? I'm thankful for Camp Victory. How many guys have ever been out to Camp Victory? Come on, these are rooms in our house. And when I think about each of these rooms, each one of them has a special meaning to this house. God wants you to dream about your own house and say, what has God called me to do? What is God stirring in my heart to do? You guys got those Legos with you? I want you to pull those Legos out. 
And um, I'm a big Lego guy. Anyone else just love Legos? Like when I was, when I was in school, my teachers told my parents that I had ADD. And um, my, my parents rebuked it in Jesus' name. But I mean, the reality was I was a little wild. Like there was an old cartoon back in the day called Ren and Stimpy. You guys remember that? I was like, ah, you know, I was like, I was crazy. I didn't need any medicine. I mean, I was just all over the place. And, um, and my mom and dad would try to calm me down. My dad would stick his hand on my head and say, peaceful, Paul. And I was like, ah, you know, <laughs> I was wild. Uh, but I, like, I, in church services, I always had to be doing something else besides just listening to my dad. Like I had to be doodling, I had to be drawing. I would draw all kinds of pictures on the church bulletins. I was an artist on there. Um, I would have some Legos, I'd have snacks, but I was still catching what he was saying, you know? So I figured this morning I would let any of the ADD people just to build some stuff while I'm talking. Um, but, I, but here's what I realized about these Legos. These pieces by themselves don't make any sense. But when you start putting them together, you're able to build something that's pretty amazing, right? So I want you to just work with the person next to you and say, let's, let's see what we can build. Take those pieces together. Yeah, and just let's see, let's imagine what we can build. Yeah, let's have a little project in church. And while you're doing that, I wanna tell you a little story. So last Christmas, I love it. I love that we are just building Legos right now in church. Last Christmas, my, my uh, mother-in-law and father-in-law gave my son, Liam, their grandson, um, a Lego project. And it was like 5,000 pieces. And it was the most intense thing. They, they looked at him and he goes, this is awesome, daddy, look what I got. I was like, that's awesome, Liam. And, and they said, Liam, ask your daddy to put it together for you. I was like, what? I was like, no, that's his toy. <laughs> and, um, and so Liam was like, do you, do you wanna do it with me? I was like, yeah, let's do it. So me and Liam sit down, I'm reading through the manual, and you know, I had to read those instructions a lot because it didn't make sense until I read the instructions, which by the way, following Jesus doesn't make sense until you read the instructions, right? There's a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense to the normal earthly mind. Like why would I give 10% of my finances away to the kingdom of God and expect that my finances are gonna do better? Because when you give into God's house, there's a manual to this. When I give into God's house, I am better off with 90% of my finances than I am with 100%. That when I give 10% of my finances to God, when I trust God, when I choose to forgive, there's a manual to the lifestyle of following Jesus. And when I follow that manual, it starts to click and it starts to make sense. So I was reading Liam's manual. I'm, I'm building this Lego set, building this project. Liam leaves after 10 minutes and... <laughs> And I'm stuck there, I'm, I'm putting it together, and, and he went to go get us some snacks and, and water, he's checking up on me, he's like, you're doing good, Dad, you need anything? You're doing great. He was a good general contractor, I just, he, you know, he was checking up on me, and I was, I was building his project for him, and, and so there I was, I was the labor. It took me six hours to put this thing together. And what I realized in building it is that the little pieces mattered. As I would get to the end or I thought the end of it, there was multiple times where I thought I was at the end and I had to go back because I missed a piece. And I realized every piece matters. Every single piece that came in that set matters. I cannot build the whole thing without the small pieces, the unseen pieces. And this is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. He says, just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body, so it is, with Christ. Or I could say it like this, just like a house has many parts to it, right? There's a kitchen, there's a living room, there's a door, there's a window, there's nails and there's screws and there's boards and all of this stuff, but it all makes one house. And he says this, now if the foot, in verse 15, 1 Corinthians 12, he says, if the foot was to say, or let's say the door was to say to the window, I'm not a window, my part doesn't matter. You would laugh, right? Because the only way to look through that window is to go through the door. And the only way the door works is with hinges. And hinges are unseen, but those small little parts is what makes the door open. And what Paul was saying is every single one of us in the church has a part to play. 
Whether you are working on cars for single parents, or whether you're a business person in the church and you say, I can't preach, I can't sing, I'm not gonna be in the choir, I honestly don't have a ton of time to serve in the nursery, but I am going to give from my company and I'm gonna help build that next generation building for the teenagers that are gonna come in there and get saved. All of us have a part to play. Don't underestimate your piece. Don't be the missing piece in the puzzle. Because your part matters. This is what Paul was saying. Your part matters. Your worship matters. Your presence matters. Your giving matters. And God is calling all of us to be a part of building his house. God's calling all of us to participate in this project. You know, uh, about a year ago, we started praying. We said, God, what do you want to do through the future of our house? We just had finished this building over here, the Next Generation building, and we had just cast the vision for the pool and the splash pad, which by the way, construction has started. They are building a splash pad at the Tulsa Dream Center and a swimming pool, and there's nothing like it in a five mile radius in North Tulsa. It is going to serve so many families. And again, you say, what's the point of a pool and a splash pad in North Tulsa? How many of y'all in this room had a chance as a kid to learn how to swim? Did you know a large percentage of North Tulsa would not be able to raise their hand on that right there? And when Tim Newton shared that with me and I started talking to some of the residents around the Tulsa Dream Center, they said, Paul, we've had more drownings in this part of Tulsa than any other part of Tulsa. What if the Dream Center got involved, not just in groceries, not just in leading chapel services and after school care, but what if we had something like a pool or a splash pad and we started teaching kids at a young age to swim and you may not see it as a big deal, but it's a doorway into the house of God. Those kids are gonna remember the church that provided a splash pad in a pool. The kids that came to camp are gonna remember. The kids that came to an Easter play and they watched ballet dancers on stage. The kids that came to Pilgrim's Playlist and they watched us do something crazy. Like there was some crazy stuff in Pilgrim's Playlist, right? But I love it because kids will always know there's a church that embraced the arts and there's a place for every person's passion in this house. There's a place for every person's past in this house. By the way, you can come to victory just as you are. You don't have to clean up to come into this house. You can come just as you are. The front door is wide open and always will be. We want people to come and to belong, to find their place, to find their people in the house of God. Paul was telling the Corinthian church, he was saying, listen, you all have a part to play. Don't make excuses. Don't think that you're just at church to receive. Like I remember when I was a kid and I just would sit in church and I would receive and I would receive and I would draw pictures and I would draw horns on the guest speakers and I would sit and receive. And man, I loved it when Bishop Jakes came. Oh, I would receive, receive. I loved it when my dad brought in guest speakers and I would, I would consume and my dad told me when I was a teenager, he said, Paul, you're starting to look fat. And I was like, what? He's like, no, 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 I don't mean that like in a physical way. He goes, spiritually, you're overweight. And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, you have become a reservoir. You are holding in all the stuff you've consumed. I was like, thanks a lot, dad. And he goes, you need to become a river. You need to start releasing and start serving and recognize that your, your role in coming to church is not to just sit in a seat and take sermons every single day, but to be a part of building the house. And he said, where are you serving? And I was like, where are you serving? <laughs> I was getting into an argument with my dad and he was like, I'm serving all over the church and I could use your help. And I was like, well, where do you want me to serve? He goes, how about children's church? I said, okay. I started serving in the 9 a.m. children's church. Then I started serving in our youth group, became a greeter, parking lot leader. Then I became a bus captain, picking kids up from Skyatook, bringing them to church. And as I started giving and serving, and I moved from being a reservoir who only comes to church to receive, which by the way, when you only come to church to receive, you get offended really quick, and it, it becomes very easy to switch churches on a regular basis. But when you become a river, you start plugging yourself in, you start planting yourself, you start giving out, you start realizing, man, I am blessed to be a blessing. I've received so much from God. How can I be a part of building the house that he's put me in? And when I start doing that, life becomes so much better. You make a living by what you get, but you make a life by what you give. And the more that I live to give, and the more that I live to serve, and the more I realize I've been given some tools to be a part of building God's house. I've been given some Lego pieces to be a part of building God's 
house. And when I look at all my pieces, my pieces are weird. I got some interesting pieces, right? Like, I, I used to wonder, what, what could God do with my pieces? I'm kind of a weird person. I kind of have some ADD. And, and, and I, I like to play guitar. I like to sing. And God says, I can take all those pieces and I can do something special with that, Paul. God will take all your flaws. He'll take all your, your quirkiness. He'll take all the parts of you that you don't even like. And he says, I can do something special when you bring all your pieces into my house. See, I'm looking at people in this room and y'all are Lego pieces. And I am too. And we go better together. Like my Lego pieces don't make sense outside of victory. But when I bring them to you and you bring yours to me, y'all, we build something crazy. Look at this. Who's doing this? We are. We are. Turn to someone next to you and say, we are. We're doing something wild. Yeah, look. Al Richardson. How long have you been at Victory? Since 1979. He started coming before this church was even a church. Look what pieces you and I just made. Who's doing this? We are. <laughs> Al, will you stand up? Sure. Al and Pat Richardson have been a part of this house for more than 40 years. Yeah. You know what I love about this? This is cool. Yeah. We might have to auction this off towards the vision. <laughs> All right. it it's got a roof. It's got like a little nose right there. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But you know what? You know what I love about Victory? It's we're a church for all generations. My grand grand over there is a huge part of this church. She's 97 years old, turns 98 Amen. this next year. Yeah. We're a church for all nations. We just, we just brought some new families here from Afghanistan. And we're so thankful for our Afghanistan family members that have just joined our church. People from all different walks of life. And you know, I was talking to some people in the back uh, that are part of the choir, and, and she said, you know, I got seven different colors in my hair. And she said, I'm so thankful that your church embraces all the colors in my hair. <laughs> and I said, absolutely. And she said, our, my husband and I have never found a church like Victory, a place where we feel so loved and so at home and so a part of the family. Yeah. This is what the church is all about. There's a room for every person in this house, and God wants you to be a part of building those rooms, expanding those rooms. In fact, the prophet Isaiah prophesied about our church. In Isaiah 54, verse 2, he said these words, expand your house, enlarge your house, build an addition. How many of y'all would say that's kind of victory right there? Like we, we didn't just build a church, we built a camp, we built a dream center, and we would not be victory without Camp Victory, without Victory Christian School, without Victory College, without the, the Tulsa Dream Center, without Ty and Debbie Barker in the discipleship class on Tuesday nights for men and women, without Tim Newton at the Dream. Like, there are so many people who make this house special. Every person's part matters. Turn to the person next to you and say, you matter. Your part matters. Say, we need you. Come on, I need you. I need you. God needs you. God could do what he wants to do without us, but he invites us. And he says, I want you. I want you to build something special. In fact, God told David, David, your son Solomon is going to build me a house. And David, even though you want to be the one who builds it, your son Solomon is going to go on and his future generation is going to build something beautiful for Israel where the Ark of the Covenant will be set and the presence of God will fill that house and they will worship and they will sing the songs that you wrote, David. God promises to David and he said, and you will always have someone sitting on the throne in Israel. God kept his promise because Jesus came through David's lineage. But when you look at David's family, it's a family of misfits. It's a family of broken homes and broken people. But God took all the broken pieces and he built something beautiful, right? He took all those pieces. I right, hear it as it's scattering. We didn't practice this. But he built something amazing. And I think about how God takes all of our broken pieces. How many of you guys have a past that maybe you're not proud of, but you're thankful for the mercy of God, that you wouldn't be where you are today if it wasn't for his grace? Come on, he brings all the pieces together. I want the band to come up. I want to give you real quickly four ways to let God build your house, because God does want to build your house. By the way, when, when, when Jesus returns, he's looking for people who are full of faith. 
He's looking for builders. He's looking for people just like Noah, who during his time, everyone else was partying, but Noah said, I'm gonna build something big. Noah pulled his family and they started building an ark. He's looking for people like Nehemiah, who sees the broken ruins of their nation and says, let's be a part of building something great. When I think about the people who are involved in building this house, we have teachers every single day who are teaching kids a Christian worldview at Victory. In a world where, where, where public school education is full of confusing ideology and people don't know what gender they are, people don't know who they are, we are trying our best at Victory to implant an identity in Christ, to teach kids at a young age, you are a child of God, you're a mighty man, you're a beautiful girl made in the image of God, and, and he doesn't make accidents. And when I look at Victory, I look at a house that's full of hope, a house that's full of faith, a house that's full of generations, and a house full of compassion. People who are saying, how can we serve our city? How can we meet the needs of the people in Afghanistan? How can we minister to the people who just lost a home to a house fire? How can we help that, that, that single parent mom who walks every single day to church? How can we get her a car? I look at a house full of people who say, let's keep on building. Let's not stop, Paul. In fact, when my father passed away, I had people come up to me and they said, Paul, don't stop building. Because the temptation is to think that your dad built everything that needs to be built. But Paul, I want you to dream big because God wants to do more. I'm so thankful that we have people in this, in this church who don't settle for where we are, but we continue to expand our vision to go, God wants to keep building this house. God's not finished here. God's not finished with 7700 South Lewis, and he's not finished with your address either. He's not finished with your family. He's not finished with your dreams. You might feel like you're done, but God says, if there's breath in your lungs, I'm not done with you. I'm not done with your testimony. I'm not done with your kid's testimony. I'm not done with your husband's testimony. I'm not done with your wife's testimony. I'm not done with your family's testimony. I'm not done with your company that you haven't started yet, but it's inside your heart. God has a plan for the dreams that you haven't even activated yet. God has dreams that he wants to give to you that you haven't even received yet. And I believe during this series, God's gonna start stirring you up to start building some of those visions, those dreams that he's called you to work on. So number one, four ways to let God build your house. Number one, surrender to his blueprints for your life. God is the master builder. That's what Hebrews says. That's what Corinthians says. He has a blueprint for your life, right? He's got the hard hat on and he says, let me come and do some work. I've got something for your house, but you've got to surrender. I remember when... Um, there was a project that Ashley and I wanted to do, and, and in order to do it, we had to hire someone else because neither one of us had the skills to be able to do this project. And so we sat down with two or three people who, who basically said, you know, um, I'd like to do this project for you. Here's what I can do it for. Here's kind of the budget. Um, and they kind of presented their skills, their ability, and, and their connections. And so we were listening to each one of them. We had to pick one of those three to work on that project. So we're sitting down, we're thinking about it. Who do we want to work on this project for us? And in the same way, every single day you're presented with some people who wanna build your house. There's people who wanna determine and manipulate who you're gonna be and what you're gonna do. And, and I'm telling you, the media is one of those people. Yeah. The media tries to sit down and say, we got blueprints for your kids. I'm telling you, MTV said, we are after your children. All the, all the channels you see out there, all the, all the programs out there, Netflix, they are after you. They wanna build your house. They wanna construct your ideology. They wanna determine what you think from Sesame Street and Elmo all the way to the commercials you see during football games. The media has a strategy to build your house. But God has a strategy too to build your house. He has blueprints that don't make sense to the world. And to some people, it's outdated. And yet it's outlasted every brand and every idea that anyone else in the world has ever presented. So I don't know, I think I'd rather trust God's blueprints than some trendy teacher of the day, than some trendy philosopher of the day. I'd rather be an outdated old school preacher who just sticks to the word of God than be some slick preacher who's making up his own theology that doesn't even make sense, just confuses people. So I'm coming back to the blueprints. What does God wanna do with my life? Proverbs 29, 18 says, without a vision, people cast off restraint. They, they do whatever they want. But when the vision is from God, when God builds the house, 
Proverbs 16, verse three says, commit your plans to the Lord. Commit your blueprints to God. Say, God, here's my blueprints. Change what you wanna change. Is it too small? Is it too big? Is, is, is there any room that you need to come in and, and change in my family, in my house? Is there stuff that I've just kind of gotten off track? I've just been doing my own projects without consulting you? Proverbs 3, verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own reason, your own logic, your own deconstruction of God's word, but follow his ways, even when they feel outdated to everyone else. And even when there's podcasts trying to deconstruct this word, if you'll go back to the word of God and allow the word of God to lead you, you will succeed in every single thing you do. Success is found in surrender. When I surrender to God's blueprints, he causes my plans to succeed. Number two, get involved in building his house. In order to let God build my house, I got to get involved in building his house. So for me, that looked like serving, giving. I remember at a young age, my dad and mom teaching me to be a giver. And they said, Paul, whenever you do a project or you mow somebody's lawn or you do something where you make some money, you help out with something and they pay you, Set some aside to give to God. And I said, well, what's that gonna do, you know? <laughs> well, why do I have to give it to God? God gave it to me, you know? And they were like, no, no, no. You will prosper with that percentage going to God more than you will by holding on to it. So at a young age, I started learning to give things away. Giving my finances away, giving 10% a tithe, giving a pair of shoes that I really, you know, loved away to someone. And every time I gave, I watched as God blessed my house. I watched as God blessed my life. Every time I would serve, by the way, serving in God's house is never wasted time. Whether you're serving in the nursery, whether you're serving in children's church, serving in the youth group, serving in the bus ministry, serving at the dream center, when you get involved with God's house, God gets involved with your house. When you set time aside, finances aside and say, where do you need me? How many of you guys have a passion for like helping kids? How many of you guys love babies? Where's like the baby lovers? Praise God, we need you. We got a lot of babies. This church is like in a baby booming phase right now. We got more babies than we do. Like there's a lot of babies back there. But I think about, <laughs> y'all like, we know, we dropped them all off over there. <laughs> we need to pray for our nursery workers right now, y'all. But I look, at, I look at some of the places in our house and I go, man, we need help. God brought you to victory for such a time as this. And, and, and you might go, well, I kind of want to not have to do anything. Like, I kind of want to just sit and receive. And that's okay for a season. But if you live your whole life that way, you're going to miss out on the joy of being a blessing to other people. Amen. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. I'm telling you, we come alive when we serve. What if you served a service and you sat in a service? What if you got in, and, and once a month you said, let's go to the Dream Center? Or once a month, you said, let's lead an outreach. Let, once a month, let's open our house for a connect group. Once a month, let's do something. And, and let's set money aside. There was a, a man in our church. I just did his funeral just two weeks ago. He joined our church in the early 90s. He would come and sit in the very top of section B on that top row, right where my friends are sitting, right up there holding that baby. And he would come in and he'd wear a cowboy hat, sit down there with his whole family. And when he first started coming to Victory, he was rough. He didn't want to hear any of this stuff, but his wife kept pulling him into church. Come on, thank God for some praying wives, some wives that just don't give up. So she kept pulling him in, and he owned a company, and, and their company wasn't doing good. They were in the red, and he was having to lay off people, but he heard my dad preaching in the early 90s, and he said, you know what? I'm going to try out what this guy's saying, and I'm going to see if it works. I'm going to put God on our payroll, and every month, I'm going to give I'm gonna pay God. I'm gonna give God a part of our company's money. And I'm gonna see what God does because my dad was talking from Malachi, test the Lord in this, watch what he'll do if he'll open the windows of heaven and bring the tithe into the storehouse. So he started giving. And he, he said, within the first six months of giving, we went from being in the red to being in the black. Then within the next year, we went from being into the very black. We started making so much money, they started prospering where they opened up multiple companies. Today, they're doing so well. When he passed away just two weeks ago, there were so many people who came to the funeral and said, I was impacted by his 
life. Not only did his company prosper, but his life got changed as he got involved in the house of God. God God got involved in his house, saved his whole family, saved his grandkids, saved his relatives, broke him free of addictions, all kinds of stuff that God did in his life. But it was all from getting involved in God's house. Number three, recognize that he's blessed you to be a blessing in his house. Every good and perfect gift comes from God above. He's blessed you to be a blessing. And number four, never forget that when you serve God's house, he takes care of your house. He takes care of your house. So so this vision started stirring about a year ago. And I, I heard the Lord say, get ready to expand and get ready, get ready for what I'm about to do. Well, I didn't realize that during the pandemic, our church was gonna grow. Most churches shrank during the pandemic, but our church just started growing. Like each campus started growing. Our North Campus, our Manford Campus, our school grew like crazy. We went from having like 870 students. This year we have almost 1,200 students. We've gained almost 400 new students in our Christian school. Every area, our online, like God, our camp, this is crazy. There's several camps around the state of Oklahoma that shut down. Like not just shut down during the pandemic, but just shut down. They just gave up. They said, we, we can't do this anymore. We don't, we don't want to use these grounds anymore to, to serve children or teenagers. So what happened was all these churches and, and kids and teenagers that aren't even part of Victory heard that Camp Victory was still open. And so this last summer, we had more than 2,400 kids and teenagers at our camp. Now that's crazy. We don't have that kind of room. We had like 800 kids on a waiting list trying to get into camp, but we didn't have dorms for them or beds for them. And 487 kids gave their heart to Jesus. Teenagers surrendered their hearts to Jesus at camp. These are rooms in our house. This house has many rooms. You might come only on Sunday, but there's people every single day that are being impacted in this house. And they're, by the way, two guys transferred into our school for baseball. They came just for baseball. One guy from Bixby and one guy from Bishop Kelly. They didn't even know like we were like a Christian school. (laughs) <laughs> they came because we had a good baseball program and a baseball field back there. And they came for baseball because they heard who our coach was. They liked him. And, and, and while they were sitting in chapel and while they were hearing the Bible being preached, they, told their, they texted their coach. They said, I don't know what it is about this place, this house, but we need what you guys have. They gave their hearts to Jesus this year, just a month ago, because of baseball. Come on, every room has a purpose. Every room has a purpose. And so we started praying and we said, God, what do you want to do? And God began to download this vision. And so we're going to pass out these cards at the end of the row. If, if, you, if you're sitting at the end of the row, if you'll lean over and we're going to pass out, it just says, build this house. And it has a pamphlet in there, a little card. We want everyone to take one home and just to pray over it. Because over the next 24 months, we're just going to share this vision. The series is only just for this month. We'll continue on with other series. But this vision is something we're committing to for the next 24 months, and you'll hear about it occasionally during offering time, but I wanna share it with you right now. If you don't mind, just passing these down. Our ushers are gonna bring them to every aisle, and I want you to see this and realize that when I get involved, when you get involved with God's house, God gets involved with your house. When you serve and give into God's house, God takes care of the needs in your house. And you'll see on there just kind of the vision, what it is all about. But we're looking at three different rooms in our house. Camp Victory, Tulsa Dream Center, and Victor Christian School. Three rooms right now that are overflowing to capacity. The Dream Center was given 10 acres 20 years ago. We maximize every square inch at the Dream Center. Every square inch is used to help minister to kids and families, and there's all kinds of programs, sports stuff out there where people's lives are being impacted, transformed every week. Same thing with camp, same thing with Victor Christian School. By the way, the Tulsa Dream Center, they, they, uh, we were told by people in the neighborhood, every nonprofit charity that opens up in this area of Tulsa ends up shutting down within a few years, and that was true. But the Tulsa Dream Center still stands today, 20 years since we started. We've outlasted bars, clubs, pimps, gang leaders. We've outlasted people that thought they could take over the neighborhood, but God's taken over the neighborhood through the Tulsa Dream Center. The same thing goes for Camp Victory and Victory Manford and Victory Christian School. While so many schools are shutting down, Victory Christian School is opening up and we're seeing people come from all over searching for a place like Victory. 
And we're seeing families come in who don't know God. And as they come to Victory Christian School, their kids are getting saved, they're getting healed, they're getting set free, delivered. And God's using this house to change families. And so part of this vision, as, as you're opening it up, I wanna read it to you. Part of this vision, it's a, it's a big vision over the next 24 months. But the Tulsa Dream Center, we need space. We need room. And we have come into an opportunity to purchase potentially 74 acres in North Tulsa that will go directly towards helping expand the Tulsa Dream Center, creating a gathering place like park of trails and a future Dream Center Academy school, kindergarten through 12th grade, where we see North Tulsa being a place that our church is gonna be invested in long term for these kids' lives. Not only that, we're completing the pool, the splash pad project, and we're going to get mobile ministry trucks going back into neighborhoods, setting church up in low-income apartment housing areas, bringing Jesus to the neighborhoods, having trucks that turn into stages with sound systems. It's, it's a crazy cool idea. Our church has done it in the past, but we, we ended up having to shut those, those trucks down about 10 years ago. We couldn't afford them. And so we're getting back into that vision. There is a need in the neighborhoods to get back in there, to bring the trucks back. Secondly, out at Camp Victory, we're expanding our camp. We're building a wedding chapel. We're gonna be building marriage retreat center and a family retreat center with bungalows where we're gonna minister to couples. During the pandemic, we saw a rise of a need where couples and families were in crisis and people were searching for Christian counseling, searching for a place that could minister to them as a couple, as a family. And so we realized Camp Victory during the fall and during the winter, during the spring, there's not camps happening. And so we're gonna use our weekends to bring couples out there with a counselor on site. And instead of sending them off to a hotel, they will stay in log cabins right inside of Camp Victory where we will minister to families and couples and, and be able to bring healing and restoration. And then we realized we've run out of space for kids out of camp, so we gotta build dorms. We're gonna build a brand new boys dorm and a girls dorm to be able to hold an extra 300 more kids out at camp during those camp times, which again, every week when you can hold that many more, it multiplies when you can have that many more kids out at camp. And then lastly, Victory Christian School. How many of you guys are thankful for Victory Christian School? You, you know either you were impacted by it or your family members. And I think about how Victor Christian School is making such an impact in our city. Last night, the boys won the district championship in Class 2A. And it was such an awesome game. It was, it was an amazing game. But more than that, you know, after the game, just walking and talking to the players and, and seeing what God's doing in their hearts and their lives. And no school is perfect, but I'll tell you this. God's doing something special at Victory. And, and you might say, well, Paul, why would I give to that school if my kid goes to Jinx? Why, why would I give into helping uh, uh, expand this school if my kid goes to Bixby? Why would you give to Starbucks? And you go, well, that's different, Paul. I pay $7 for my latte. You think all seven bucks is going to that latte? It takes them like a dollar to make that latte. The other six bucks go into the organizations of Starbucks Choice. So you are sponsoring whatever Starbucks wants to sponsor. And you go, well, it's different. What about Target? What about Walmart? Not, not everything you buy is actually, but when I give into the church, this is kingdom work. Every single penny goes right into helping more kids know Jesus. And to me, that's worth it. Whether my kids go to Bixby, Jinx, or Victory, or Bishop Kelly, or, or, or Nathan Hale, wherever your kids go to school, I realize that every time I give into God's house, if 10 cents is going to Afghanistan, and 20 cents is going to Camp Victory, and 30 cents is going to Victory Christian School, and again, we don't like talking about money sometimes, but we need to understand that every time we spend money, something is going somewhere. But Jesus, God, invites us. He, Jesus said it in Luke 6 and Matthew 6, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, but store up treasures in heaven. And when I give into the kingdom of God, when I give to change kids' lives, when I give to help families, help minister to couples, help expand the Dream Center, one day I step into eternity. By the way, my, my mother-in-law went to be with the Lord this last week, Ashley's mom. And y'all have been praying for her, and, and it, was a, it was a heartbreaking moment. But when we were standing in the hospital room, we were worshiping. When she went to be with the Lord and, and, and stepped into eternity, the tears that started flowing down the family's cheeks this last week, and we started talking and reflecting, we realized she was a builder of this house. She gave of her time, of her finances, of her treasure 
Her kids were at Jinx for a long time, but she would bring her tithe into Victory, and she said, I want to help build up Victory Christian School, and one day my kids are going to go there, and sure enough, her kids ended up at Victory Christian School, but then she started giving to the Dream Center. Why would she give to the Dream Center? She didn't live in North Tulsa. Her kids didn't get anything, any benefits from the Dream Center. She believed in helping other people. See, when you give, you're not giving for your own benefit. You're giving to, to help advance the kingdom of God. And every time she gave to the Dream Center, every time she gave to this church, she was, she was creating an account in heaven. And when she stepped into eternity this last week, she stepped into a, 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 a welcome from King Jesus. And he said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with what I blessed you with. All of us in this room have been blessed. The fact that you live in the United States of America alone is a blessing. There's people all over the world that would love to be in this country, that would love to be in this church. We are blessed. And so we're going to go into a time of offering and worship. We're going to end the service right here, but I don't want you to leave yet. I want you to pray as we get ready to give. I'm going to invite Daniel Henshaw up here to just pray over our offering. He's going to explain this card to you, and our worship team is going to lead us in a song, and we're going to respond with prayer. And maybe you're here today and you say, Paul, I got nothing to give. That's great. That's fine. You don't have to come to church to give something. You could come and just receive. But at some point, I want you to challenge your faith and say, you know what? If God has called me to be a part of advancing his kingdom and building his house, then I'm going to get my faith involved and I'm going to believe that I can be a giver towards that vision that's going to help reach more people. Daniel, tell them what Amen. Happening. Come on. How many people are excited about this vision that pastor has shared and you know, the invitation that he's given is an invitation for all of us to pray, Lord, what is my part to play? How can I be about advancing the kingdom while I'm here on the earth? Every day is an opportunity to do that in all the different ways that he shared. And in that packet that you got is a uh, pledge card here, just a couple things on it on the left-hand side. It's an opportunity just to pray, Lord, is there a pledge that I'm being led by your spirit to give? And if you're not ready today to make that, you can take this home with you, pray over it bring it back or on that right side if you say actually there is something I want to give specifically toward this vision you can fill that out and then on the bottom there how can we pray with you what is God doing what's the vision God is stirring in your heart you know pastor stirred us this weekend on this vision that as we're about building the house of God God is also about building your house and we've seen that time and time again 40 years of incredible vision and advancement of what God is doing through this house and through the ministries of victory, locally, nationally, across the world. But I know this, every time there's an opportunity for us to advance what God's doing in this house, I've seen in my own family's life, I've seen in friends, I've seen in so many stories like the one he shared, that God is about advancing his people as well. When God can get it through you, God can trust you to get it to you as well. And I just wanna pray this morning and maybe say, you know what? I just wanna give my regular tithe and offering. You can do that in this moment as well. You can text VICTORY to 28950. That's something that helps us, like Pastor said, every dollar that comes in, we're not stopping what we're doing. We're continuing to reach people every day. And that is possible, made possible through our gifts that we bring through our tithes and offerings. But today, if you say, I also maybe wanna give something directly towards this vision, you can text the same 28950, but instead of victory, you can text the word build, and that's an opportunity to do that, or fill out the pledge card, drop it in the offering bucket when it comes by. And I just wanna pray over this time, so Lord, we thank you. God, that is your stirring vision in our heart. Lord, we know that you're the God who provides the vision, and you're the God who provides the provision. We sang earlier in worship that you are Jehovah Jireh, which means the God who provides. So Lord, we know that you're faithful to provide. Lord, we thank you that not only you are faithful to provide for this house, you're faithful to provide for every person in the room, every person watching online, every person connected to this. There is a blessing that is on the house and on the people of God. You outlined it in Deuteronomy 28. So Father, we thank you for that blessing to be upon every person that's connected to this house. And as we continue to commit to build your house, God, we know that it's much more than just the things, but as Pastor shared, it's an open door to the gospel, an open door to reach more people out north, an open door to reach more people that come across the campgrounds of Manford, an open door to reach people through Victory Christian School, an open door to reach people across every room in this house. So God, we thank you that every day we have the opportunity to advance your kingdom here on the earth. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Where our ushers will be by in just a moment. Let's worship together. This is my covenant. 
This is my offering. These are not empty words, but a heart that's surrendering. All that you want of me, I'll give you everything. Lord, let my life be a worship song to you. Here is my heart, Lord, a vessel you can use. Have it all, have it all. I lay me down, I'm all yours now. Have it all, have it all. Pour me out, I'm all yours now. There's nothing more beautiful. reading this book by C.S. Lewis called Mere Christianity. And in the book, he put this quote that I thought was so powerful. I want you to imagine this. He says, imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps, you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right. He's stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that those jobs needed doing. 
and so you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of. Throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he is building a palace and he intends to come and live in it himself. Church, God is building a house in you. He's building a house through you. And he wants to live in your hearts. More than anything, he wants your heart. And I want us just to close our eyes all over this place. If there's a part of your heart that you need to surrender to God, if there's a part of your house that you're saying, man, I need God. I need his grace. I need his help. I need to invite the Holy Spirit to do some work in my life. I'm a fixer-upper. There's some areas that I just need to remodel, you know, in my, in my house. I need to refinish. I need to restore some stuff. I need God to redeem some things in my life. If you're here today and you know that's you, I want you to lift your hand up all over this room. You're saying, God, would you come and would you make your room, make your home in my heart? Would you make new some rooms in my life? Would you restore some areas in my life? Lord, would you transform some parts of my heart? Would you break off some things that need to be broken off? And would you add in the things that need to be added in? He wants to do it today. He wants to come and do something brand new in your heart. Maybe you're here today and you say, Paul, I'm not right with God. I need to get right with God. I need to surrender to him. Today is your day to do that. Would you lift your hand up if that's you today? To say, Paul, would you pray for me? Would you pray for my house? Would you pray for what I'm walking through right now? I need the grace of God. I need his blessing on my family, on my house. If you raised your hand or you wanted to raise your hand, would you leave your seat, come and meet me at this altar? The altar is open today for any person who says, God, come and work in me. And we're going to cheer on brave men, brave women, boys and girls, parents, grandparents. Today is your day to say, God, I surrender to your blueprints for my life. Lord, I surrender. I want you to build the house. Lord, I want you to build every part of my life. God, I want you to be in charge of each part of my life. He wants to do it. And I hear God saying, you're not too broken for him to fix. You're not too messed up for him to mend, for him to heal. You're not a long shot. God is close to the broken heart and he says, come, bring all the pieces and I'll build something beautiful. Come and bring every part of your life. Even the rooms you don't want anyone to see. Something just comes to my mind, and, and I haven't said it in any service, but I've been thinking about it this weekend because I, I, I'm a movie person, and so every now and then God will bring a movie thought to my mind. And this weekend, he kept bringing to my mind, did anyone in this room ever see the movie uh, Beauty and the Beast, the, the cartoon? And there was the room that he never wanted anyone else to see. Like he was like, you could see anything in the house, but you can't go to that one room. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And it was the room where he had lost his splendor. It was the room where he had lost who he once was and he had turned into a beast of a person. And it got me thinking this weekend as I was reflecting on what C.S. Lewis said and, and you know, throughout the scripture, what God says about our lives, that sometimes we, we give God most of the house, but we say, don't go into that one room. Don't mess with that one room. That room is off limits. No one's allowed to touch that room. And God says, if you only knew what I could do in that room, if you only knew that I'm already close to that room, God says, I've seen it, I know, and I'm with you, and I love you, and I'm for you, and I can change, and I can, rene I can renew, and I can redeem, and restore, and I can go in, and I can remodel, and I can fix those broken pieces. He's with you this morning. He loves you. And I want us just to all pray this prayer together. Say, Jesus, I surrender to you. My life is yours. Come build this house from the inside out. Do what you want to do. I surrender to your blueprints. You're the builder. And I'm all yours. 
Help me, Holy Spirit, to be a part of building this house. God, however you want to use me, I'm yours. You're my Lord and Savior. I receive your mercy, your grace, your strength. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, God's doing something good in your life. Let's build this house together.